Good evening. Wilkinson here doing another podcast today. Been getting some done here because I'm selling my house and who knows when I'll have time to do it. But anyway, I'm here with Ted Fox. I was calling him David and he goes, who's David? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on, I'm back on track. So I'm here with Ted Fox, who is the owner of Fox News. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Just we were talking about that. Anyway, say hi, Ted. Hi. Hi, Ted. Oh. <laughs> How cliche. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Ted has a Facebook page called... That explains a lot. And we'll get into a little bit of that later. And I'll, of course, have the links to it if you want to see what he's up to uh, in the episode notes. But So let, let's hear some of your story. Ted, who are you? Where'd you grow up? Uh, grew up in Memphis as my hometown in a crazy, hyper-religious family. 12 years of private Christian school, but I was gay the whole time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the whole time. Never knew a day when I wasn't. Been all around the world. Uh, I was a competitive diver for years and years. And believe it or not, in 1974, I was national synchronized trampoline champion. <laughs> really? I'm not making that up. <laughs> yeah. Now, was that in the water? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> because at that time in Memphis, there were no out, there were no indoor pools. So we dove during the summer and then during the winter, we would jump on the trampoline to stay in shape. Okay. And that turned into its own thing. Well, cool. Then what? So what are you about? You uh, said you were, you knew you were gay when you were what, five or something like oh, that? Oh yeah. Absolutely. But you didn't have a, we didn't have the word gay attached. To that. No, didn't know what it was, but you knew by, you liked boys or what? Oh, yeah. I was playing with other boys by the second grade, other classmates. Well, that doesn't in itself prove you're gay because guys fool around with guys and that's part of growing up. Mm, not, I was different. usually the one doing the seducing. <laughs> did, did, you fall, did you fall in love with some of them? Uh, no, it was uh, it, mostly just this one kid that we just... Uh, one weekend I'd spend that night at his house and a couple of weekends later he'd spend the night at my house and his mom who was a Vietnam widow and my parents were both like we love it when Phil comes over and she love and Phil's mom just I love it when Teddy comes over because as soon as dinner's over they go upstairs and they're so quiet little did they know we had our mouths were full let's just wow say. At how old? <laughs> Seven. Okay, I'll, I'll let my listeners picture that. We're not going to be explicit <laughs> we'll, on that We'll one. move along. Okay. So then what happened? What was it like? You were in Tennessee at that uh, point? Mm -hmm. What was it like having gay urges when you were a kid in Tennessee? You know, it's odd. I was totally okay with it until I hit puberty. I don't know why that made a difference, but it... I, I have I, some theories, but we won't go into that. Yeah. I suddenly decided when I hit puberty that, oh, no, gee, I, okay, Jesus, fix me. It's time to fix me. This Everybody's telling me how awful this is and how it'll ruin my life. So, so let's work as a team and you can fix me. And two years later, I said, this Jesus, you have let me down. Forget it. Oh, huh, yeah. wow. So what are some of the stories in the... In the meantime there, you were telling me earlier about an incident with your piano teacher. Let, <laughs> let, let's hear that one. When I was 13, I thought he was a fantastic music teacher and he really was a brilliant musician. But then when I was 14 and we started the next season, about three months or so into it, during the middle of a lesson, I should clarify though, his name was Eldon Percival. And he looked and behaved exactly like you would expect someone named Eldon Percival. So he was a walking cliche. Oh, boy. Okay. And then one day during the lesson, I, I, I don't know what changed in my head. But, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Vertigo where the camera, you know, the dimension of the camera and the to start. To, I had that moment. I looked at this instructor and... I felt as if I was backing away from him. And I thought, is that what I am going to become? Is that what, is that my future? And I, I lost it. And three weeks later, he said, you know what? If you don't start being nicer to me, I'm not going to teach you anymore. And that was all I needed to hear. He was gone within two weeks. Oh. <laughs> so you were not nice to him? I was not nice to him because he scared me. 
And I thought that was my only future, which is odd because my grandmother's baby brother chose to live with for 27 years with another man when they met in 1936. And Uncle Jimmy was not my uncle, but Uncle David got up in the middle of the night in 1963 and just collapsed dead from a heart attack. And Uncle Jimmy was at every family function for my entire life, and he was always welcome. And Uncle Jimmy had, you know, really showy diamond rings and he loved his white wine and he loved taking my mom shopping and he'd be her, (laughs) you know, he'd help her decorate the house. And then when I came out and mom said, I've never known anybody like that. And I said, mom, who's your brunch buddy? Who, who, uh, mom, well, you know, he, 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 they, they dated women. I swear they did. Mom, they, mom. Did you say I'm not going to be gay or I don't want to be like that and be a gay like that? Well, at first it was, I don't want to be gay. Then okay. when Jesus failed me, it was like, I, I, I'm, I've got to figure out how to be gay and be okay with it. But that is, I don't want to be that gay. I don't, okay. and I don't mean, I, I, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to become him. I don't mind being that gay because God knows I'm just that gay, but in different ways. So what was the next step in your journey? Uh, well, after a couple of summers trying to do missionary work for, you know, again, begging Jesus to fix me, uh, I started, uh, by the time I was 16, I had a fake ID and I was sneaking downtown to the gay discos on the weekends. Uh, this was in Memphis? In Memphis. Okay. It was called the Rain Check 2. And, uh, it was a great club. It was, I, I can't even tell you the sense of freedom I had, you know, and this is 1975, 75 or 76, either way. Right. And, and the music, especially being in Memphis, we got a wider variety of dance music in the clubs than, you know, j- just the disco text. Right. What, what was the legal age? In was Tennessee, 18? 18. It was eight. Time. So it wasn't 21. No. So no. you were 16 passing for 18, yes. not 21. Okay, yes. gotcha. Okay. Uh, and again, loved, loved, loved this club. My senior year, uh, my quote unquote beard girlfriend who could dance up a storm, she, I, I took her with me to the rain check <laughs> weekend after, and she loved that place. So oh. it was a great haven. But in, I think it was at the end of my junior year I was sitting at the bar one night just rocking to the music and looking out over the dance floor and I looked at the front entrance and went holy Moses that looks like the youth minister for my church and I looked up again and it and we looked directly into each other's eyes it was like holy shit that's Jay Letty oh no and I look up just in time to see him panic and turn around and run back out the door. And the very next day, suddenly I was the enemy. He started using Jesus and religion as a blunt force trauma against me. Oh God, couldn't wait to get away from him. Could not wait. That was kind of ballsy to do that. We talked a little bit about this before we started the podcast, but I mean, I would think that he would have been concerned that you would have outed him because Uh, he was in the gay bar. It wasn't just you there and, oh, I have telescopic vision and I see you over there. I mean, he was in there with with you. Yeah, well, he he did have a wife, but she was, I, I have always believed his wife was at least five or 10 years older than he was. And they, they made a mutual decision not to try to have kids. So I don't know if it was just a marriage of convenience or or what, I don't know. But then when I was 18 and I had to run away from somebody who was regularly beating me up two months later, there's a knock on our apartment door and I open it up and it's Jay Letty and the doctor who birthed me 
telling me that God is gonna get me and you need to come back to Memphis. It was like, I did not invite you here. I'm sorry you spent the money on the plane tickets, but you need where, to... where were you? In, in L.A. at the time. They came to L.A.? They flew to L.A. to try to collar me back to Memphis. And I said... Yeah, I should have exposed him. Come on. I Well, <laughs> but if I had... After that first incident, I'm sure he would have said that he went down there to see if I was there and to see if the rumors were true. I'm, I know he would have done that. He I, Years later, it turns out he counseled a kid in his youth group in Arizona into committing suicide. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was taken to court for wrongful death by the parents and the... Christian jury acquitted him. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I guess time for karma, huh? Yep. <laughs> Definitely. That's the last you heard of him? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, my, <laughs> I have three sisters. All three sisters have stories about him. They're, they, they, you, they, you know, they want him, they want karma to come after him. But one of my sisters is actually watching his every move on Facebook. And every time he comes after her and tries to preach at her, she says, Oh no, you don't. You, you really, you want me, you want to go there? You, you want me to tell the stories? I will Jay. And he backs off every, but gratefully she does. She's not telling me. I, I know this is going on, but she's, she knows I don't want to hear any of that. And he so. is. He's still in Arizona. He's still in Arizona. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. All right. So you're 18 when he comes to you. Mm-hmm. Then what? I closed the door in his face and uh, the doctor who birthed me stuck his foot in the door and actually said, God's going to get you for this. Thanks, Dr. Andrews. Get lost. That's a little bit of crazy. That's more than a little bit yeah. of crazy. <laughs> wow. So yeah. then what'd you do with yourself after that? Traveled around California trying to find something stable and a, you know, a secure job. And it just, it just wasn't happening. And me and the man who told me he was my boyfriend, although he was sleeping with every single gay man anywhere within a six mile radius, uh, the whole time. But we went, eventually moved back to middle Tennessee and we got jobs at the Musgrave pencil factory in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Considering where we were, it was a pretty terrific job to land, but we were, going hungry and we hated this little tiny single wide trailer we were living in. And (laughs) I remember one day there were several people sitting in the circle of chairs around me, but I was sitting in the middle of the floor in front of the coffee table. And I'm looking around at these people and I'm thinking to myself, I hate these people. I hate my life. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get away from I don't care if I have to go to jail to get away from these people. Well, a month later, the guy who claimed he was my boyfriend said, I know where there's wild marijuana growing up in the cornfields. Let's go pick some and we'll bring it back and sell some. Cool. So we drive to Indiana, pick this wild marijuana, which actually turned out to just be hemp. There was no THC in this stuff whatsoever. And then we drove it back to Tennessee and we got all settled. And then we, okay, so Casey, you go to sleep, you go to your house and sleep. We're going to stay here and keep an eye on this stuff. And an hour later, there was this banging on the door and banging on the door. And then they kicked the door in with machine guns and 15 cops and three TV cameras, one from all three stations. So it turns out somebody turned us in before we even left for Indiana. So they were watching us the whole time on the road. They knew every move we were making. And then two days later in the county jail, the man who said he was my boyfriend said, oh, did I ever mention to you that I did three years in a German prison for smuggling hash? Uh, no, you failed to bring that up. Well, I'm just letting you know, cause I will not, I'm not going back to jail. And the next day he called the sugar daddy who showed up with $5,000 cash and said, I want Maloney. And they 
opened the cell door. So for five grand, he was let out? Five grand cash handed to the sheriffs in this little podunk country town. Oh, yeah, that got he got exactly what he wanted. Where'd and the cash go? I, God only knows. So they opened the cell door. He walked out. They closed the cell door behind him. He tossed me a pack of cigarettes and a deck of cards, and he waved. And it turns out the next morning, he skipped town on his sugar daddy and vanished and was never heard from again. So he literally, they, did, they never caught him? They caught never him. caught him. Wow. And I, on the other hand, got sentenced to two to five in the penitentiary for possession of marijuana. And it wasn't even marijuana. Uh, I, did, I actually did 14 months for and got out early for good behavior. Got out in November of 1980. So, oh God, that's so hard to believe. I've been out of prison for 42 years. Good God. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing to think about. Within, now, it, is, is grass legal in Tennessee now or not? I, I don't think so. I still okay. don't think right. so. I'm not sure. In December of 81, I was walking through the theater building at Memphis State University. I saw a poster for auditions for a park in Nashville called Opryland, USA. And they had rides, but their whole focus was live shows, live musical shows. And I said to my friend Steve, you know what? I, I think I'm exactly what they're looking for. I think I'm going to audition for these people. And Steve said, oh, don't, Ted, don't do that. You will embarrass yourself. Don't make a fool of yourself. Don't do it. And I looked well, at... Well, what did he say after you got the job? <laughs> this, this day was the last day I ever saw Steve. Oh, really? But I looked at him, and in my head, I went, watch me. And I beat 14,000 people and got the job at Opryland. No dance training no musical training, and I beat 14,000 people all across the United States and Canada. So there's one job opening? Oh, no. For the entire part, they had 300 entertainers Okay. in all the various shows. But they had that many apply for various... They had 14,000 people audition for one of those slots. It was amazing. And one of the greatest experiences of my life, I'm still really close friends with several of the kids that were in my cast. Uh, and there's a, a woman who is now, she's been in Germany for 30 years. Uh, but my beloved Duchess, Sandy Williams, uh, I fly to Germany to visit her. I sang at her wedding, which even though they've been together for 30 years, they just got officially married oh. two years ago. And I got to go sing at Sandy's wedding. I mean, so you sing. I sing. I, I actually had an album out in 92, encouraged to make this album by Ron Romanowski and Paul Phillips, uh, who had a 17-year career uh, writing and recording gay-themed gay music. So what did you do at the amusement park? It was an amusement park, you said, right? Yeah. Um, my so what, what were you, were you acting in little plays or what was it? The show I was in was called I Hear America Singing. And it was the history of pop music from the 1920s up until the 1980s. And there were, uh, there was a major dance number in each decade. It was a 55 minute show. And in 55 minutes, I had two quartets, three duets, and two solos. I had 17 costume changes. We did five shows a day, six a day on the weekends if the park was really crowded. And the show ran almost 10 months. And after taxes, I took home $160 a week. Wow. Yeah. Good for you. But yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> yeah, but again, it was worth it. It was such a great experience. It really was. So what was the typical wages then? I'm trying to figure. So that was 80 or, or 80s, 82. right? 82. 82. Remember in, let's see, I worked at a bank just before I got married. Well, I guess I was married. I was 22 in New York and I made... Let's see, what did I make? Sixty one hundred dollars a year. Wow. So it'd be like a hundred and I was getting like a hundred and ten or whatever that comes out to be. So wow. but that was, you know, a little bit before then, eight years before. Still. So, or ten years before. Still. Yeah. So that launched your uh musical career? That was the first time that I that that was the first time that I was a professional. That was the first time I actually got paid to be a performer. 
And you learned how to dance? I already, because of my diving and gymnastics and trampoline, I, I had no dance training. I have, I got a lot of soul for a transparently white guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because I, again, because of my sports training as a kid, you want, show me what you want me to do on the dance floor. I can do it. Double so pirouettes. did you have your divers build still at that point? I, I actually improved on the diner, divers build just because there was so much dancing in the show and we had to do it five times a day and we only got 20 minutes of a lunch break. So every day all summer I was eating an apple and some yogurt. So for the first and only time in my life I had defined abs and, and oh, oh like really I, I actually hate seeing those those old pictures <laughs> uh, oh well my moves have have just taken over so <laughs> well things happen yes they do see so from 82 so the last 40 years what have you been doing making music actually i released again i released an album in 92 uh it the critics loved it it didn't make me squat for money, but I toured all over the country for three years. I actually got to stand on the stage, just me and my guitar, singing a song that I wrote at the 1993 National March on Washington for 1.2 million gay people. Wow. It was outrageous. And then in 94, I got to perform again at the Gay Games uh, in New York City. Uh, I, I was so lucky and the greatest thing that ever came out of that, I, I was living in Northern New Mexico when the album, when the album was first released and I get a phone call one day from this guy saying, I live in the Houston area and I was listening to a radio station the other night and they featured some of your music. I really liked it. Can I buy a copy of your album? Of course you can. I told him where to send the check. A week later, the check shows up wrapped in a le handwritten letter, and it turns out this was a 13-year-old kid in a toxically homophobic Catholic Hispanic family getting beat up at school, and, I, and he, he heard hope in my music. Well, well but when he, you said he called you to talk to you on the phone? Uh, the first time, yeah. So you could tell he was a kid, though, at that point, uh, right? No, I didn't. I oh, could not a, tell. He had a deep voice? Yes, he did. And uh, I, we... So he wasn't like your piano teacher then? <laughs> uh, no, he's not, he, he wasn't then. Again, I never, I had no clue what he looked like. Right, right. Uh, we started exchanging letters. Uh, well, when I got his letter, I knew that there's no way I'm just going to put a cassette in a envelope and say thanks no way i have to talk to this kid right so we became pen pals for a little while and then one time he asked if we could actually speak over the phone okay but you call me collect so there's no paper trail for your parents to follow and we had a couple of phone calls and then the next letter that showed up was from his parents who had ransacked his bedroom while he was at school one day and they found my letters and my cassette and they threatened me with arrest and corruption of a minor and if you ever speak to our son again you know prison and and i was like whoa and my lawyer friend said you have no option back off you it's 1992 you don't have a prayer walk away and that well hopefully the kid made it uh actually he did as soon as i had access to the internet i started trying to find him just to make sure he was okay and alive and uh, with no luck and then in in uh 2020 i decided to take a writing class and i was trying to tell this story about this kid and then I got hold of a friend of mine who's a uh, LGBTQ historian in Houston. Said, so JD, who would be, in 1992, what radio station in Houston would be playing my music? And he sent me pages and pages and pages from his archives all about the show and the DJs and the radio station. And then he says, why, are you, why do you want this detail? Well, because I'm telling this story. And then he, and when he heard the story, he was like, oh, my God, please tell me you still have that letter, that, that first letter from the kid. No, no, long gone. Well, send, you know, send me this story kind of thing. I want to archive this because this kid was from Houston. Okay, 
We'll see what we can come up with. And an hour later, JD has thousands of followers across social media. And an hour later, suddenly there's a post from JD saying, we've got to help Ted find Homer. And he gave a brief synopsis of the story. And he said, you guys know what to do. Go. And how, so wait a minute, what year was this then? 2020. Okay, so he would have been how old? Like 30, I'm doing math here in my head. He is 42. He just turned 43. Uh, so the parents have no say. So <laughs> not yeah, not anymore. At this point. So but, so but, he he sicked everybody on you and or this, on the and, story. And this tight this army of people who have no idea who I am started playing Sherlock Holmes and they kept sending me messages. I think we're getting close. We met, is this him? No. And honest to God, less than 24 hours later, a woman named Lindsay Beauchamp said, I got him. I'm sure I've got him. And I went and looked at, at what she was sending me. It was like, Oh my God, it's Homer. Oh my God. So I sent him a Facebook message and all I sent was the, photograph from the cover of my album and then another message and all I said was Homer oh my god such a reunion I had I hadn't I had never known what he looked like he is so smart he's so funny he's so politically involved uh and really big and uh working for the trans community and uh, i'm just so proud of this kid I, last year for my 62nd birthday i flew to new york city to meet him for the first time face to face and so we, he's in new york he's in new york now and we actually met in front of the stonewall inn and just had hours and hours and hours of wow. catching up in conversation. It was really wonderful. So he escaped his parents. He escaped his parents. He says his dad got sober and they eventually started trying to reconnect. Uh, unfortunately, his mom has gone full on Trump extremist. And right. so he, they've got, they have no contact anymore. Well, I'm glad he escaped and I'm glad oh, he's you and still around. Both. Oh, I'm so proud of him. Yeah, so proud cool. of him. Wow. You know, just doing the podcast... And I'm kind of getting a little emotional here. That was a, a very touching story. But, um, well, as I started this, I thought, who eventually will be the listener? I mean, I, I've got everybody listening, gay guys and straight people. And oh, that, yeah. But I thought it's, it's, you know, the kid or the even like the, the man in Iowa that has no real community, doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. and, and just hearing all these stories, the real life stories, not sitcom stuff. Yeah. Not you know, movie stuff that somebody made up or crazy stuff, but just real life. This was my story. And like yours, I mean, I made it out yep. and Homer made it out. Homer made so, it out. Yeah. And what you said, that's very true. What you said, because I realized, and I've talked with, uh, Romanovsky and Phillips. I, I'm still really close with them. And it, w it was true all those years when I was touring behind my album. Yeah, I, I played Chicago and LA and San Francisco and virtually all the big pride fests all around the country. But when I played New Pulse, New York, it was 400 people shoulder to shoulder, standing room only. And when I played in New York City in the village, there were 11 people. Wow. Because they had all the other options. In in Hot Springs, Arkansas, my giving a, a concert was actually a big deal. There was no open gay culture. It, it, it right. absolutely worked out that way. It really right. did. I get it. Yep. All right. So you have your uh, storytelling thing on Facebook. Talk I do. A, talk a little bit about that. Well, it's just fun. When when uh, I've been singing with the Palm Springs Gay Men's Chorus for seven seasons, and when COVID hit and we had to cut, you know, and stop rehearsing, uh, I posted up on our member page just saying, guys, you know what? This would be a great time for us to get to know each other better. I know your faces, but mostly I just know the other second tenors sitting around me. You know what? That This should explain a lot. I'm going to tell you a story about how I wound up here, where our lives are intertwining. And I told a story and for the first few weeks, and I would tell another story once a week. And for the first few weeks, people started also sharing stories. But then they stopped telling stories. But all these people kept saying, oh, this is, this is so, I can relate to that. 
So it just became this thing. Every Thursday, I would make another 10-minute video and tell funny stories about, you know, when at times I put my foot in my mouth or some of the celebrities I met and, right. you know, and it's it's just been so much fun. And much to my surprise, uh, surprise, people all across the country have been watching these. Uh, I've got people in Ireland. I've got people in the UK, I mean, Great Britain, I've got people in Germany, some Sw- some Swiss, it's, it's really amazing. That's great. Tell us the name of it. That explains a lot. That's one word. A, that's a Facebook group. One word, but each part of that word is capitalized, so okay. it's easier to see. That explains a lot. Okay, and we'll put the links in the uh, the episode notes. Mostly it's just stories about what a what a goofball I am. And <laughs> Is that an open group or do they have to join it or what? Uh, um, anybody is welcome to join it if they find it. But they have to join it. It's not like just, it's on, it's not on Facebook, like open source, right? Oh yeah. It's just, it's they, just a page. Okay. Yeah. It's just, so they can look for it. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll put your info in there. So wrapping it up here. So you've had a journey. So here's our <laughs> listeners listening to us at this close of this episode. What would you, uh, what would you want people to know? Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. Uh, when I was a little kid in church, I was covering my ears because this guy on the next pew was so bad. And my dad kept saying, put your hands down. Put your hands down. But dad, he's, he's, make, he's hurting. And dad said, look at his face. I was maybe four or five, but I looked at this man's face as he was singing all the wrong notes. And I got it. I, it made sense to me that, you know what, even if all those wrong notes are coming from the bottom of his heart and they're so sincere and I got it. And my dad just looked down at me and grinned and nodded his head and said, make a joyful noise. So your father must have had one or two soft moments. Too. He had, he had uh, so grateful that we re- when I left San Francisco to get clean, we reconciled and the last eight years that he was alive, we had a fabulous relationship and he passed in 2012 okay yeah all right sounds great oh man thank you for doing this this is you're welcome david just kidding (laughs) (laughs) thanks ted oh glad you could come in thank you for having me it was good